Hey guys, Mr. Mice is here. Um, I think this live stream is supposed to go on at the right time, five o'clock. Um, we have about an hour, and actually, I'm sorry to do this to you, but I have to eat dinner too. Um, so it's going to be kind of weird. I'm going to try not to uh, eat too loud so you can hear me and still go over the material that's necessary for this next test. Um, this is for my AP stats test, but my class is a, it's a unit test, but my class is uh, is cumulative. So e each unit has a cumulative exam. So this is kind of equivalent to a first semester uh, midterm or final, I guess, a first semester part of an AP stats class. So uh, if you're a part of my class, uh, you can either uh, ask questions on the um, the YouTube feed where the questions are, or you could do that on a classroom. I have both those open right now. I just go over there and take a look. Um, let me see what I got here. Uh, right now, there's nothing in there. And um, well, someone says cool, cool. Uh, or you can use Google Classroom, and I'll try to keep those streams as well, too, uh, open so you can ask questions. But what I'd like to do on this one is just kind of go over some of the things that are going to be important for you. Um, first, I'll kind of quickly talk about the multiple choice. And then I'll go over some problems that I think are similar to the ones that are on the free response section. So um, let me quickly talk about the multiple choice. I'll take about five minutes here for that. You've got uh, eight about eight questions that are coming straight from uh, unit eight, oh, unit eight, sorry, eight questions from unit five. And those questions are dealing with uh, random variables. So you have something looking for the expected value in the standard deviation. Um, you're gonna need to use some random variable arithmetic. So uh, adding two random variables, which I'll do an example of that in, in just a bit here. You also have uh, sampling distributions of proportions and sampling distributions of means. So in each of those cases, make sure you know how to use the formulas for those z-score to find the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. And uh, if you are gonna find a probability using a sampling distribution, what is that z-score gonna look like? Uh, I, wanna, I wanna make that clear because on the test, I might not ask you to actually do the whole problem. I might just ask you which is the correct setup for the problem uh, or or maybe something about one of those uh, three conditions. Like, you know, why is the 10% condition important? Um, the 10% condition is important because we need to make sure that our sample size is uh, small enough that we can assume that each of the, the trials is independent so that we have independent groups uh, otherwise, uh, we might have taken too big of a sample out of the population. Or what is the success failure condition? Why is that important? What is the uh, central limit theorem in terms of uh, telling us about the standard deviation as n gets larger? And we did a few of those in class, so make sure you, you go back and take a look at the central limit theorem. Uh, so you got a, a few of those. You got three, I think you have three sampling distribution problems. Um, and then we have some problems that come from other units. So let me talk about some of those that come from other units. From unit one, you're gonna be looking at things like, how do you take a simple random sample using a random number table? Or um, how do you know if something is an experiment or an observational study? And uh, what are the differences between those? What are the implications of doing an experiment rather than a, an observational study? Which I'll talk about in a little bit too. And uh, also, uh, and pretty much that's it. And I think the problem that I, the, the stuff that I talk about in just a bit in the free response section, you'll, it'll clear that up for you. In unit two, we talked about um, data and analyzing data in terms of graphical displays for quantitative and categorical data. So make sure you understand the connection between the mean and the median in terms of symmetric, they're gonna be equal if it's skewed to the right. Let me think about where skewed to the right is because I was the visualize in my head. If it's skewed to the right, then the mean is going to be larger than the median. If it's skewed to the left, the opposite is going to be the case. So make sure you understand that connection between the two. Um, 
make sure you can find the median or the mean or the standard deviation given data or given a, a graphical display. Uh, and that's as simple as kind of just, you know, finding halfway through in your calculator. Um, what else? Know how to find outliers. And uh, there's two ways to find outliers. You can either find outliers using a normal model and seeing if the z-score is greater than or equal to two standard deviations above the mean or negative two standard deviations below the mean, or you can find the fences. And uh, when you're dealing with uh, uh, normally distributed uh, information, then you're gonna use the z-score method. If you don't know that and you know maybe the five number summary, then you're gonna look for the fences and you're gonna see if anything's outlier that way. In the next unit, we talked about regression, and you'll see some problems on regression here. Uh, some of the ones that you'll need to be able to do is interpret the slope of a regression line, and I'll do one of those in the free response for you. You'll need to be able to understand and, and interpret R squared. Now, I'm not gonna be doing that on the the, uh, the free response here, but you, need, you do need to know how to interpret R squared. So R squared is, remember, it's the, uh, percent of the variability in y that can be explained by the model or by variations in x. Then uh, we also talked about residuals. Make sure you understand residuals and you understand what correlation is and, and how, um, you know, correlation doesn't change if we change, if we change the, the units. Uh, if we flip x and y, correlation stays the same. So understand those those key points of correlation that we talked about in the class. And if you don't know, I do have a video on that. <laughs> I have a video on a lot of things, right? Um, and then finally, uh, that was, and then in unit four, we started doing our probability stuff. So you can pretty much bet that you're gonna see something with a binomial distribution. I love throwing binomial distributions on tests because I, I think they come up a lot in the AP exam. So. I'm going to throw a binomial distribution there somewhere. Um, I like if-thens and, uh, um, you know, conditional probabilities, given that. So take a look at those. And I'll do an example of that, too, in just a bit here. And just kind of looking over my notes. And then just some basic probability rules, you know, like uh, uh, adding two probabilities if it's an or, I'm multiplying if it's an and, um, tree diagrams, Venn diagrams, things like that. Um, I don't think the problem or problems on there are too outrageous. So um, just make sure you can tell the difference between what, what type of method you're using and I think you'll be okay with those. So uh, at this point I wanna, kind of use the time that I have to go over those problems um, that I've, I've kind of written here um, that might look like the free response. But uh, before I do that, well, actually, you know what? Why don't I do that? And then I'll answer some questions. We'll have like a Q&A session with the remaining time because I don't know how long it's going to take me to go over those problems, okay? So I'll go ahead and, and share my screen here with you. You'll see infinite meiosis for a bit here. Whoa! Okay. <laughs> now we're now we're experiencing. Okay. Now you might hear me chewing on some food here as I as I start working on these. Okay, suppose the golf scores at a local course can be described by a normal model. Hopefully this, you can see this clear enough. I'm gonna go and draw the, and label an, uh, the normal model here. This number here represents mu, and this number here represents sigma, which is the standard deviation. So I'm gonna go ahead and, let me see, let's draw. Draw my normal model. 
someday you'll be as good as I am <laughs> drawing a normal model. Maybe, maybe not, right? Okay, so I'm gonna go right in the middle here. I'm gonna put 80, and then I'm gonna go one, two, three standard deviations above the mean, one, two, three standard deviations below the mean. I'm just gonna add five each time. 85, 90, 95, 75, 70, 65. I'm gonna go and write the empirical rule down here, which it doesn't look like I got very symmetric. 68%, 95% goes two standard deviations above the mean, below the mean, and 99.7%. Okay. All right. I also have to label this. So what is this? This is golf scores at the local course. Now, if you do not label this, you are going to miss points, all right? So make sure, what's the big giant word that I have in the back of my classroom? Context, make sure you have context. Here comes a crunch of nachos. That's right, my nacho cheese, nacho cheese. This is my cheese. All right, what is the first quartile of golf scores? So, Unfortunately, the computer that I'm using does not have my TI uh, Inspire on it. So hopefully you have yours near you. I have my other computer going as well. And I will be using my TI Inspire on that to get me the answers to these. Um, but what is the first quartile of golf scores? So the first quartile is at 75%. What am I talking about, Willis? 25%, right? 25% less is going to be my uh, first quartile. So that's going to be, you know, somewhere, it's going to be somewhere around here, all of this right here. So what I need to find is I need to find that value right there. Now we've got two options to do this. Um, either way, you're going to need to use inverse norm. Now, my preferred way, I'm going to show you my preferred method. And then if you know the whole, you know, put put the values in your, calculator method and just show that that'll work but my preferred method for free response looks like this so what I would prefer you do is first find inverse norm using 0.25 as your area 0 and 1 is your standard deviation and your uh, I'm sorry your mean and your standard deviation now what this is going to do is this is going to find your z-score all right, it's going to find the Z score that corresponds to um, 25%. Now it's going to be 0 0.67. Now, if you've memorized that, that's great. You can do that. So, you, this is your Z score that corresponds to 25%. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that number and I'm going to set that equal to my formula for Z score. And I'm looking for X. My mean was 80, and my standard deviation was 5. And then I'm going to solve for x, okay? So 5 times negative 0 0.67. I'm going to add 80 over, and this should give me my first quartile, okay? You can hear my, my daughter in the background. She's the cutest, but I'm biased. 6, 3. All right, and um, this is context here, it's just score. So, you know, this is actually in strokes. There's my first quartile. Okay, you're gonna hear another nacho. What percent of golfers are expected to score par or less for the course? Now, par or less for the course, that's 72. 72 looks to be about somewhere in here, <clears throat> so that's what I want. I want the probability that I get um, golfers that are less than or equal to 72. So again, I'm going to give you my preferred method, and that is to find the z-score for 72 
strokes here, 72 minus 80 over 5. All right, so 72 minus 80 over here, putting it in my calculator. It's negative 1.6. I want the probability that z is going to be less than or equal to negative 1.6. And I use uh, normal CDF for this. Okay. Um, normal CDF is going to end up looking like this for you guys. And I'm going to write it down, but you don't have to write this part down. Because by just finding the, the z score, that's good enough for your work. Okay. This is, this is work right here. This is excellent work. You don't have to write this part down, but I'm going to write it so you know what to put in your, your calculator. Your lower bound is going to be like this. Your upper bound is going to be negative 1.6 because we're looking for the area below that. And your mean and standard deviation are going to be 0 and 1. So what is that going to give us? Some of you are already ahead of me. You're like, oh, I got it, Mr. Rennes. I got it. 0 0.055. All right, so uh, what percent of golfers are expected to score? Less than par for the course, that's 5.5%, okay? Now, does that mean that out of 100, uh, if 100 golfers come and, um, you know, does that mean that if 100 golfers come and, uh, and, and so five, five of them, the, the guy in the shop is gonna say, hey, you know what? 100 golfers are gonna be in here today, Five of those guys are going to shoot par or less. Does that is that what that's saying? And the answer to that is no. It's not what it's saying. It's saying we can expect or approximately that's going to happen. It might happen, but this again, the normal model is an approximation. It's not like it's not like like definitive. So you can't definitively say you can't definitively say, oh yeah, five people are going to shoot par or less. You could say we expect five. Could be more, could be less. Um, so we've got to be careful in the way that we we present that, right? Okay. Let me go back to screen share that. All right. Let's go on to number two. A sample of it. Go ahead and read this while I take a bite of my burrito. Got to eat now because I got to do a going to a performance for my sons in chorus. All right, so this, these show up a lot in the AP exam. You got to be able to read the um, computer output for a regression. It's very very easy to read. You just got to know what to look for. So you're first going to look right here where it says dependent variable. That's your dependent variable, which is y. Then you're going to go to where it says constant. It's always going to say that same thing. Constant right here, that number, that's going to be your B0 or your Y-intercept. Uh, intercept, okay? Then you're going to go to the other context, whatever that is. It's going to be something. All right? This is your, um, this is your explanatory variable. Okay, or your X, which means this one right here is your slope. All right, and you're going to use your formula Y hat equals B sub zero plus B one X, but I want you to write it in context. So what do we got? We got percent BF hat is equal to negative 42.734 plus 1.70 times waist size. Um, I should have said between percent body fat percent and waist. Sorry, didn't copy it down correctly. Okay, and that's it, guys. That's all there is to it. All right, you just got to spot the right things, okay? All right, so interpret the slope of the regression line. So here's my slope again. What does that say? That says... For every increase of whatever this is, 
I'm going to see, since this is positive, I'm going to see an increase of whatever this is on average. And that's what I would expect. Remember, we can't use definitive words. We've got to have some loosey-goosey words in there somehow because, you know, my prediction is just that. It's a prediction. It's an estimation. So I'm going to say that for each increase of one inch, I'm guessing it's inches. I don't it doesn't say. I'm guessing it's inches in waste. One inch of waist size, forgive my sloppy handwriting, we would expect an average, keywords there guys, expect an average increase of 1.7% body fat, okay? Make sure you got these words in there, okay? Otherwise, you're going to miss points, right? You don't want to miss points. Calculate and interpret the correlation coefficient. What the what? Okay, where we got where we got that at? Look up here. It says R squared is 67.8. Okay, so R squared is 67.8. Well, we know R squared is 0 0.678. So R is going to be whatever the square root of that is, which can be easily calculated as 0.823. Make sure you know with the, that this is going to be positive. Why is it positive? Because my slope is positive. If the slope was negative, then my R would be negative. Don't be tricked on that. I've seen lots of students in the AP exam get tricked on that. Okay, so you got to pay attention to your slope for when you're calculating R. Now let's interpret that. So you're going to basically say 88.82 88, is a pretty good correlation. So I think what we say is we're going to say the linear strength of the relationship between percent body fat and waist size is fairly strong, right? R is equal to 0.823. That's a pretty strong correlation. And, all, and that, that's all it says. It's not like R squared. R squared is the, is the percent of variation. Um, R is different. R is just the strength of the correlation coefficient, okay? And it does tell us, obviously, the slope is positive. All right, let's move on uh, so that I can make sure I, I get this done in enough time. All right, what do you guys see here? I see two means and two standard deviations. When I see two means and two standard deviations for two different types of things, variables, I automatically think I'm going to be doing something like this. Probably, right? I'm probably going to be doing something like that because they're probably going to ask me to add these things to these two things together because um, that's what they like to do. And this goes with the uh, random variable arithmetic. So what is the average weight of the cat and dog that can be expected for one family? So that we're doing one cat, one dog. What's the average for one cat, one large dog? So the... Um, the average, let's go with uh, mu of cat and dog, should be equal to eight um, eight point nine for the cat plus seventy pounds for the dog, seventy eight point nine pounds. 
That's it. All we got to do is add. All right. What's the standard deviation? Well, the standard deviation for the cat plus the dog is going to be the square root of 1.8 squared plus 3.3 .3 squared. And that gives me 3.76 pounds. Make sure you put your pounds there. You need your units, okay? So you're using that uh, Pythagorean theorem thing of standard deviations for random variables. All right, uh, here's a new, here's a question. What percent of families with one cat and one large dog could the hospital expect to end up using their special discount? Well, it says that the discount is only for families as long as the sum of their weights does not exceed 85 pounds. I was already told that both of these were normally distributed. If both of these are normally distributed, the sum is normally distributed. So what I'm going to do is I'm really looking for the probability that I have a sum. I'll call the sum X. Okay, X is equal to the sum of the cats plus the dogs. I'll call the sum X that the X does not exceed because they want to know how many they're going to expect to be able to use. So it does not exceed 85 pounds. So what I'm going to need to do now is I'm going to need to find that Z-score. This is just like the first problem here. So I'm going to need to find a Z-score. 85 minus um, the total was 78.9. That's the average now, okay, right there, divided by the standard deviation that I found in the previous problem. Okay. So let me go to my calculator now. I didn't, I didn't have this one set up here. Uh, 85 minus 78.9 divided by 3.76, it's 1.622. And so I want the probability that Z is less than or equal to 1.622. So I'm gonna use normal CDF, okay? So in your calculator, it's gonna look like this. Normal CDF, negative 9999, 1.622. 0 and 1, because I'm using a z-score, so I'm going to leave those as 0 and 1 when I'm using a z-score, right? 2, um, 1.622, tap, 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 tab, and I'm going to get 0 0.948, um, okay? So they can pretty much expect not about 94.8% of their families with one cat and one large dog are gonna end up using the discount. So they better be ready for that, right? Okay, there's an example of using that. that uh, well, let's go with a fun color. Let's go with pink. Does that show up very well? Yeah, okay. Let's talk about uh, experiments and observational studies. What are the major differences between experiments and observational studies? Really, what what do you want to? How do you determine whether an, whether something is an experiment or observational study? Plain and simple, you need you need to have treatments here. Okay, experiments have treatments. Observational studies, no treatment. Okay, if you don't actually put a treatment on participants or subjects uh, or experimental units, those are all the same thing, okay? Uh, subjects, experimental units, okay, um, participants, That those are all the same thing, guys. So if it's ever asking for that, it means what are you kind of using uh, in your data, in your experiment? If you don't put a treatment on it, it's not an experiment. Now, if a question asks you, is this an observational study or an experiment? Make a decision, okay? And then base your decision on the context of the treatment that would need to be done for it to be an experiment. Let me give you an example. If let's say I, I let's say the problem is an observational study on um on uh, um, um, hitting curveballs, 
And all I do is watch the, the uh, all I do is gather information on the baseball players that hit, uh, either they hit the curveball or they didn't. And I'm not actually giving the treatment. I just look at how many, you know, how many uh, batters hit curveballs in the, over the last year. Now, if I go do the experiment, now, it, let's say that's the observational study. So what my explanation would be is that this would be an observational study because, because I, didn't sep I didn't get participants and have them hit curveballs or not hit curveballs to determine if there was a relationship between that. So I have, to, I have to state what those treatments would be if it was an experiment, okay? It, hopefully that makes sense. The last um, AP exam, some people, uh, students missed that because they said, oh, it's an, ex it's an observational study because uh, there were no treatments given. Well, that wasn't good enough. You had to say what those treatments would have been given for it to have been an experiment, okay? And why, why it was an experiment. Basically, if it's an observational study, state why it's an observational study and why it's not an experiment, okay? Um, another major difference between the two is that experiments, um, if you're properly randomized, randomized placement of treatments, then you can imply cause and effect. It's got to be done right. Observational studies, no cause and effect. Simple as that. Okay. If, if you randomly place your treatments and uh, you've done your experiment, you can uh, imply cause and effect relationship. If it's an observational study, you cannot. Okay. So I think those are the some, some of the major things that you'll need to be aware of. Um, make sure that you can identify treatments, you can identify factors, you can identify what subjects you're using, and you can identify if, uh, in fact, this is a blocked experiment, um, or if it's not a blocked experiment and it's none of these, um, it, it just um, be able to describe the observational study, be able to describe it as retrospective or a prospective study. Um, did you gather your data as it was going on? You just kind of watched it going on, or did you gather your data from previous accounts, um, data that already existed? So uh, make sure you can you can describe those. Okay, all right. Number five. Again, this is time for a bite of burrito. Okay, so I'm going to create a stem plot, often known as a stem and leaf plot, right? So um, I only have one digit here, so I think what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go with, um, I'm almost going to do this kind of like a sideways like a sideways uh, dot plot, all right? So I'm gonna go ones up here. One, one, wait, how do I say One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, all right. One, two, three. It's still gonna be a zero. Now, if these were teens, I would, or like, like if it was like 42, then I would put a four there and a two there, right? But it's not. So I'm just gonna do it this way. You don't have to use different colors, I just choose to. One, two, three, four, three, four, five threes. And we've got, oops, we've got a couple of fours. One, two, three, three fours. and two fives. All right, so if I'm looking at this, okay, I gotta have a key. So we're gonna need a couple things here. We're gonna go AP scores, and then we're gonna have a key here. Zero, two equals two.
score of two, okay? So if I'm looking at this, the general shape of this looks to me like it's skewed to the right. So if I describe the distribution of scores for these students, I'm gonna say that um, the distribution of AP scores for this practice exam is, oops, skewed right with a median of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10, 2, 3 is 2.5. The median of 2.5 and a range mm, i'm going to use the range but it's probably better to use the iqr but the range of of four because the range really doesn't tell us much we only know it's one through five right um there's really no there's no unusual features now you don't have to write no unusual features i'm just going to write it here because there's there aren't any um, but, you know, if there are, you want to do it. So what we are doing is we're doing cuss here, right? Center, center, unusual features, shape, and spread. Make sure you get all, all four of these things and you get context, all right? You get those things, you're going to get all your points for that. That's pretty much it. Um, there's another question on there, but I'm not going to give it away. Um, you're going to have to think about that a little bit more. All right, number six. Look at that. I'm doing great on time. I'll have to eat more of my burrito a little later. Okay, so uh, go ahead and read this while I take another bite of burrito. <laughs> Okay, what's the probability? By the way, um, if you're laughing at this question, um, I made it up because I'm gonna go. <laughs> I'm going with some friends to go see this movie on Friday, and I just, I don't know. My my, whenever anybody asks me to do something, my first reply is, "Yeah, let me talk to my wife first. So <laughs> I think it, uh, you know. I think this problem is real life here, um, but you know, that's me. So what's the problem that no more than two guys get to go see Star Wars? That no more than two guys get to go see Star Wars. So no more than two guys would be anything two or less. So that's just gonna be 0 0.05 plus 0 0.015 plus 0 0.015. That's gonna be, what's that, 35%. And that's it. What is the expected number of guys that will be going to see Star Wars? Well, that's the expected value. And you have to write out your work, okay? You can't just write the answer. And I'm gonna stress that, that you cannot just write your answer for expected values. If there's an expected value problem on the AP exam, they are gonna expect, <laughs> Get it? Expect. Uh, they are going to expect you to write your um, your work down, as I just did right there. Okay. <clears throat> so let me go ahead and enter this in my calculator. And four times. Notice that the highest probability is that all four of them get to go. <laughs> Two point eight five. 2.85 guys get to go see Star Wars. Okay. What is the probability that all four guys get permission from their wives? <laughs> given that, it just sorry, cracks me up. Uh, given that two wives have already allowed their husbands to go. Okay. So what is the probability of all four given two? Okay. So that's going to be the probability 
of four and two. So, um, so four and two divided by the probability of two. All right, so this is a little bit tricky here. Um, the probability all four guys get permission from their wives is going to be 0.45. Now, given that, so we got to divide that two have already allowed their husbands to go. 0.15. Now, when I made this problem up, I don't think that 0.15 and 0.45 are independent. If each of these is independent, if the number of guys going is independent, then you're going to need to um, you're going to need to multiply those probabilities together, right? Um, otherwise, you just you leave it like this. Oh, that's not going to work. So, all four guys get permission from their wives, given that two wives have already allowed their husbands to go. Um, well, let me do a little math here. Maybe I should have reworded this question. Given that at least, maybe I should say, given that at least two wives have already allowed their husbands to go. Um, I think actually what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to do this 0.45 over 0.15 plus 0 0.20 plus 0.45. We're going to, have to add all those up together. All right. Maybe I should know how to work this out before I, uh, <laughs> I made the problem up. All right, that works better. 0 0.5625. Okay, I'm just getting word here, or it said 37 minutes ago, but I didn't realize that my mind isn't working, that this is being restricted somehow on our... So let me do something here. Oops. It shouldn't be restricted um, it shouldn't be restricted whoa you hear that echo that's cool that's because I have my other one on uh, <laughs> okay uh, it shouldn't be restricted on your Chromebooks because uh, it's on a channel that works so I don't know what's going on there with that um, Wow uh, um, Hi, Ryan. Haven't heard from you in a while. Anyway, I don't know who Herpa Duper is. Um, wow, there's a big, uh, a lot of words here. Okay, so let's see what's going on. Oh. Um, that, those were the, so those were the problems. Um, that I that are similar to the ones on the test. Hold on, guys. Whoa, infinite, infinite. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Okay, hey guys. Um, so those are the problems that I that are similar to the ones on the the test coming up. 
tomorrow for some of you, the next day for others. And uh, if you are if you were not able to view the live stream and you're I don't know why I'm talking to you because if you're not able to watch it, then you're not watching it now. But if you're watching this at a later time, you're going to be able to pick this up on YouTube once it gets on to YouTube. All right. Um, so I'll answer some questions for the few viewers that are here that want to um, ask a few questions. I can try to answer those now. So I'll go ahead and take a look at the uh, stream both the questions or on Google Classroom. Um, so I do have one question. Uh, when do you use inverse normal? And you use inverse normal when you are finding the z-score or the value on the normal model given the percentage. So if you know the percentage and you know the area under the normal curve, then you will use inverse norm. If you're looking for the percentage, you're trying to find the percent and you know the z-score or you know the value there, then you're using normal CDF, okay? Normal CDF finds the probability, just like binomial CDF found a probability, geometric CDF found a probability. That percentage in the normal model is the probability. Normal CDF finds the probability. It finds the percent. Inverse norm finds the z-score, finds the value given the percent, okay? Oh, I said hi to Herpa Durpa. Noah. I'm not gonna bring you nachos tomorrow though, just so you know. <laughs> Your spirit animal, man. So I'll stay on for a couple minutes here if anybody has any questions. Um, a couple minutes here. Woo. That's weird. Um, it's... You can also use Remind. I'll go ahead and open up Remind. So I don't sit here looking weird, just staring at things for um, minutes. Um, last thing I'm going to say is make sure you know your terms. Um, make sure you study vo your vocabulary tonight. Um, if you remember, if you do all the things that I talked about tonight, you should be fine. Um, studied the problems that I just did. Uh, they are new problems. I made them up tonight. And um, studied the problems from the last review. And you should be good. Okay? Uh, talk to each other. And uh, if you need anything else, um, don't hesitate to talk to somebody else because I won't be at home <laughs> or on my phone because I will be at my son's performance tonight. So, um, Hopefully this is enough and I will see you all tomorrow or some of you on Thursday or some of you not at all. Good luck in whatever class you're taking. Um, and uh, out. Talk to you later, guys. <laughs>